Hey, all you action figure enthusiasts out there, JC here with another TNI interview. So this is a new series that I've started recently where I talk with folks in the toy industry. And for today, I'm going to be talking with David Vonner, who now currently is one of the design managers on Mattel's WWE action figure line. But before that, David worked at Hasbro. He was probably the, the biggest driving force behind the three and three quarter inch Marvel Universe line. And then before that, he worked on six inch Marvel Legends for both Hasbro and, and for Toy Biz. Toy Biz is where he got his uh, big start in the toy uh, world. Now, unfortunately, there was I did have a little bit of a technical issue with this video where I lost the first 15 minutes of the interview. So this is we're kind of jumping in towards the end where we're talking about his time at Toy Biz and then we move on to Hasbro. So just to kind of fill in that little gap that, that I lost, um, which I feel really bad about. But um, Dave, basically, he got into all of this. He was he loved to draw. He went to school for drawing. Um, originally, he wanted to be a comic book artist and uh but he ended up he got his first kind of big job working for the retailer known as spencer's he was one of their i, I think he said he was the first uh in-house uh product designer that they hired uh to you know design all the kind of weird products if you've ever been into a spencer's you know they carry a lot of weird stuff so he was like the the first guy they brought in to actually in-house design a lot of that product and from there he started working with uh a, a gentleman named Digger, who was the founder of Art Asylum, another toy company, and a name you maybe have heard before if you caught my interview uh, last time with Jerry Macaluso. Uh, we talk a little bit about Digger as well. So um, Digger, basically, uh, they were working on a Kiss line um, for Spencer's, and and Digger basically was very impressed with David and said, you know, suggested that he maybe um, think about uh, working in in the toy industry. So. Um, David did. He left Spencer. He actually went to a toy company uh, where he was working on some preschool stuff, was not happy with that. So he left there and then he uh, saw an ad in the newspaper for a job at Toy Biz and he applied there and he got it. And from there, he started working on uh, lines like Lord of the Rings and Marvel Legends, working with folks like Jesse Falcon and stuff. And and that's where we kind of pick up here in the interview um, at the tail end of him talking about, you know, his love with working with all the people he met at Toy Biz. Uh, there was a story he talked about where uh, somebody had picked up one of the props that they had there in the studio for for Lord of the Rings, a bow and arrow, and it actually went off and the arrow went flying past Dave's head. Um, which they laugh about now, but I, you know, I wonder if they really were laughing when it happened. Uh, he seemed to s indicate that they did, but definitely kind of a funny story. Um, again, I'm really bummed that those first 15 minutes got lost, but that pretty much catches you up to uh, where the interview actually uh, picks up here that you'll be seeing. And from there, we talk about Hasbro and his work on the three and three quarter inch line and the struggles and everything that they had to deal with in getting that line launched. And then from there, we go to Mattel and so on and so forth. So hope you watch the entire interview it is a long one it's a uh, just uh, under an hour and you know but a lot of interesting stuff and let, let's just jump into it. you know and and um and 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 we just went through and, and with that we went through a bunch of life experiences together you know and 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 we're, we're all still friends to this day you know, so it, it, it's cool, it, and it's cool to see where, where what everyone is doing now, and and, and and everything, and their transition in life, still doing, still doing it for them. So it's pretty cool. Now, obviously, you know, things started to kind of wind down at Toy Biz, and Toy Biz ended up handing the license for Marvel over to Hasbro. Was was that a situation where you just basically? Did you have to like apply to work for Hasbro, or was was you you and well, others had, coming um, over? What happened? There was a because uh, I actually had left before before every like that whole transition that happened, and um, so I was actually at another company, and I had got a phone call, and and they had asked, you know, <laughs> would I be interested in in interviewing that at. at at Hasbro in regards to Spider-Man Marvel. And I thought it was a joke. I thought it was, I actually thought it was Jesse Falcon playing a prank on me because we always get like phone pranks and all that stuff. So I just, I just thought it was a prank. And and um, so it turned out that it wasn't. And, and um, so, you know, I went there and, and uh, you know, 
interviewed and everything. And, and uh, so in the beginning, and got hired, but in the beginning, it was like, it was understanding, it, it was, it was a, it was a learning process for everyone that was involved for, because Toy Biz had a certain way of doing things and Hasbro had a certain way of doing things. And um, it was also unique, man, because this is like the first time when you actually had, you know, like former, like the, the toy guys who worked on particular lines. Now they were handing this, everything off to this major toy company. And they were also kind of overseeing and guiding you know the process too so you know it it was it was a unique transition you know everyone was trying to learn and understand each other's process um another unique wrinkle in it was the internet was, was really bubbling social media was really starting to to blow up at the time so there was a lot of like forums were, were big and everything so the fans could be able to chime in in ways where they never could before so there was a lot of, you know, people weren't particularly happy that Hasbro had acquired the license, you know, right. so they started, you know, talking about how they had their, you know, concerns and from past product and everything. So it was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, dust and atmosphere at that time, you know, and, 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 um, and you know, people were just uncertain. They, they weren't. The fans were uncertain about where Hasbro was going to take everything, you know, and, and um, I think Hasbro was kind of like, you know, trying to, you know, continue on the legacy of, of what Marvel is and build on the legacy of what Marvel is, but also, you know, venture out and do do unique and better things, make it more fun and, and, and encompass kids you know, uh, a little bit in, in unique ways where we can capture them very young and, and keep them there and make it more of an evergreen type of product because that that whole DNA is there, you know, Marvel, and that's one reason why we love Marvel because it is an evergreen product, you know, right. so it's like, how can, we, how can we get more kids involved and, and not isolate the guys who are already involved, you know, so and that, that was a unique that was a unique um, thing, you know, and, and for people to voice their opinions and concerns in new ways that were, weren't really available before, it was a whole new era in, in not only toy making, but also what influences the toys that are made. I mean, Hasbro did have some, I would say, hit some uh, speed bumps when they first took over Marvel Legends. Um, certainly, uh, Hasbro is come a long way since those early days but also i mean another big change which i don't think necessarily happened right away when they took over the license but you know they shifted scales i mean they were still doing six inch but you could definitely tell they started putting their emphasis on yeah. the smaller marvel yeah. universe line which you had a big People hand upset about that man fans <laughs> will they would take the whole about that man you remember when, like that fantastic four wave that came out it was like scale yeah. and well, you you get these these two, you know, the the four inch collectors and the six inch collectors, and any time that there's multiple lines, you know, you, it's like they go to war with each other. They go to war. They go to war. But on your and, end, you know, it's, and and that war, that's yeah. I mean, I, that kind of for me kind of segues into Marvel Universe, you know, because um, obviously Hasbro you know, at that time is known for G.I. Joe, Star Wars, and doing three and three quarters very well, which a lot of fans were once, once the news that came out that Hasbro had acquired the license, a lot of fans were looking forward to that because that's something that we all wanted to see. Right. And, you know, it, or at least to continue on or build on what the old uh, uh, Super Wars line was, you know, so, you know, but then there were a lot of fans and a lot of growing new fans who appreciate the love of six inch figures. And once, you know, even when the six inch line, when, when the six inch figures first came on, on board, like five inch people were kind of ticked off about that. Like, they just, hey, you know, and, you know, it, but it was like that generation was dying off. So, but, you know, it, it was Marvel Legends was, were done was, was done so well, and then with everything else that encompassed that scale, that you know there was just uh, a worry about quality, a worry about 
uh, continuity. And and um, I think that on the Hasbro side, you know, we were kind of like, yeah, let's I mean, let's show what we got. Let's let's do this. And and um, I mean, because there's talented crews and talented artists there as well. So uh, everyone was kind of really on the Hasbro end, like kind of taking a lot of lumps. But they were biting at biting at the at the bits to really show what they wanted to do, you know. But that war, that war was something that was like made, from my viewpoint, made Marvel the Marvel Universe actually the line one of like really unique because it, no other line kind of had to go through that kind of vitriol that was going on at the time. Yeah. It, and probably even today, I don't think a line has had that kind of kind of turmoil. We might be seeing that here soon with GI Joe, but I don't think we. Yeah, well, you know, GI Joe is is is, is um so in entrenched in our minds of what it is. You know, even like back in the eighties, a lot you know a lot of kids didn't didn't um have the old you know well, that's right. Yeah, they didn't have that, and 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 the three and three quarter inch figures had on their own just along with the cartoon and everything just create this whole new world universe where like that's what it was and of course like you know kids knew what star wars was and there was no there was nothing before that right. so um you know it, it was you know three three quarter inch always had its you know particular following but it just once things started getting bigger and more fun and more features and, and then when McFarlane came and added more detail and everything and things just started getting more and more sophisticated and and also the generation started to get older right so we started to grow up and and we don't want to revert back to something that's not sophisticated you know so i think that part of the fear was that man you know marvel legends is going to turn into this three three quarter and it's crap and what are they doing? And, you know, so <laughs> it it was it was a lot of that. Now, I mean, how much of a hand did you have? I mean, I, you kind of became the face of Marvel Universe, the, the the Marvel Universe line for Hasbro. But like behind the scenes, how much of a hand did you have in pushing the line and 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 just the overall? Um, that was that was my baby, along with um, you know, it it was it was. As f from the design standpoint, that was you know, like all my baby, and I, I really wanted to, to, sh to showcase what was in my mind. But then we also had like you know my, the marketer Scott George, who's a big big Marvel fan, and we had like our engineer Bob Harper, Forrest Lee, the, the copyright. Like we were all like big Marvel fans, right? So and we and, and of course we love three and three quarter inch too. So you know it, it was it was cool having all of these other people in that were behind you that could take your vision, but they can also run with it too, with, with the same uh, uh, passion that you have because they love it just as well. So we can communicate in ways where you could just start spitballing, throwing things out and we would get it. And then we could just want to start executing. Whereas we didn't have to try to understand where one, one another were coming from. We, we all knew the common language, you know, and, and, um, but I remember like just kind of, and I also kind of took a page out of Jesse's book, you know, when he created Marvel Legends, man, I mean, he, we were all, he used us all and we were all involved, but it was like his thing. Like he, he, he kept it for himself. He, he planned out the whole world of how everything was going to be. And, and, um, and, and I think like, that's what, that's what I wound up doing too. And um, and that was the only way that I could articulate and express that vision to the other people that were involved, like our painters and everything, and 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 just everyone that was involved. How being able to express that and carry it forward so that people can take that baton and run with it in their own lanes as well. I remember when we when I when I first when we first got the samples done, um, you know, we had. I wanted the diorama like I like that was the only that was the only way that I felt that it could really be like showcased so we had this phone for diorama of like a sentiment and it was just it was really just the x-men that were just were, were done at first and the, the 
classic X-Men, you know, Storm and Wolverine. Well, Storm was the name of Colossus, Wolverine. And, um, you know, it was it was super fun. And, but it was fighting like a, like a Sentinel that was like phone core and everything. And we showed it to Zach Oates over at um, from Wizard Magazine, Toy Fair Magazine. Toy Fair, yeah. And he saw that, he looked at it and was like, he just stared at it. He was like, this is beautiful. Then he said, this is going to piss a lot of people off. <laughs> <laughs> now, now did, you know, we talk about the war with the collectors. Was was there anything similar behind the scenes? Like, did you guys butt heads with the folks working on, still working on the six inch stuff? Or was yeah, it? I mean, it, it was, it was a lot of, it was a lot of, it was a lot of fight going on because you know, on on that, even though even though Hasbro wanted to do the three and three quarters line, like I really didn't want it to look like a Star Wars or GI Joe line because in my mind, in my mind, Magneto would beat the hell out of Darth Vader any day, any given day of the week, seven days <laughs> out of the week, you know, twice on Sunday. Like yeah. that's just how it is for me. So and 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 I wanted I wanted the Marvel characters to look like the kids. Beat the snot out of Star Wars figures or GI Joe figures. So, with 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 that in mind, it was it really it was trying to push how I wanted the figures to look, you know. And and um, and so what the first thing I actually went to try to do was to use the old Toy Biz sculptors to work on it, on 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 the figures, and that wound up proving like to be kind of difficult and uh because like you know they were used to working like dave dave cortez he actually sculpted the, the first marvel universe talk and and uh you know he was really used to working and and doing two ups and everything being 12 inches but you know with marvel universe everything was done one to one and like at that scale you know so it was it was a little bit difficult to try to um you know to convey the marvel legends look and three and three quarter inch, you know, and, and so so then I was going back and forth with that, like you know, it, it, this thing has to be on its own. It can't be Marvel Legends 2.0, like it ha really has to be its own thing. And then it just so happens that um, that's when I was at a at a party and I met a uh, well, I already knew him, but Adam Van Wickler. I'm sure you heard his his name brought up quite a few times and it, yeah. You know, <laughs> You know, that's when I met Adam at a party, and I'll never forget he came up to me, man. He had a, had a drink in his hand, and he's like, you need me to work on your Marvel stuff. And he's like spitting all in my face and everything. I got like, I got like his drink all over my shirt. And I'm like, you know, he's going on and on and on. I'm like, man, you're giving me a shower right now. <laughs> but um, but we were talking, but he really conveyed his his, his you know, and it, it, for those who don't know, Adam is with General Giant um, sculpting sculpting um, house, and and uh, he was like, man, like, let me just take a crack at sculpting these. And so the first figure that the first one that he sculpted was Green Goblin, and uh, so that's when I was like, man, this we gotta, this is where we have to tighten up, and I want to make it exclusively work with these sculptors and. I don't want to work with the Hasbro sculptors. I don't want to work with the old legend sculptors. I want to work with, with these guys. And that kind of proved to be a bat internally a battle in and of itself, you know, because, you know, some people weren't willing to give up that control. Right. And, and um, or at least see that. And, and um, so, you know, and there was, there was a, a particular opinion of Marvel Legends and, and how Toy Biz stuff was made. And, and, and um, so I just, I, m when I finally had, you know, got it, what I wanted to do, I just canceled out all the noise, stuck, you know, stuck by my guns and, and rolled with General Giant. And that's when everything started to become better and better as far as like, not only like detail, but um, just, just how like the sculpting, the sculpture work, some of how how the parts would move, um, and 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 also too like with me and and, and three and three quarters. One reason why I love it is because with something as vast as Marvel, 
you know, you, you can really play with, you know, there's, there's, there's a plethora of characters that you, that you can use, but also there's, there's so many characters, there's different heights and, 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 and that you can incorporate, you know? So that was something that was so intriguing that we can actually have like, you know, a, a true scale Wolverine with a with a decent sized Sentinel and then everything else in between. Like we can do Frost Giants, we can do Giant Man, we can do all this wild stuff. Cause in my mind, like, you know, those those big guys, they are three and three quarter inch. You right. know, they just like they're nineteen like Galactus is a nineteen eighteen uh inch figure, but he's you know, he's a three and three quarter inch scale guy, you know, and everything just kind of works in that. So once we got everything rolling and clicking, like that's when, that's when uh, it started to really pay off. But you know, in the beginning, it was really just a fight to try to get that vision going. You know, and and um, like the file cards, you know, <laughs> um, the copyright actually got pulled off the team. We started working on some other stuff, so I just went in and, and wrote all the file cards, the stories, and everything. And I went, I was just, it was so much. Even though it was my baby, it was a it was huge, a huge collaborative effort. But there had to be someone to be the champion of of the whole thing, you know. Right. Someone had the champion, and and that was something that I learned from Jesse. Like he was the champion of Marvel Legend. Like he, he he convinced a lot of folks in the potential of that line, you know. And we, in the beginning, people just didn't see the vision or didn't get it. So it was like Marvel Universe was faced with the same thing, but it was, it had, you know, this this comparison that was next to it that wound up, you know, that was, you know, everyone was saying it's not Marvel Legends, it's not Marvel Legends. I'm like, yeah, it's not Marvel Legends, but you shouldn't compare it to that, you know, it's compared to what it is and have it be on its own. And, and if you don't like it then, then that's cool, but don't just say that it's, it's Hasbro and it's not Marvel Legends, therefore it sucks. <laughs> and, you know, and and there was a lot of that. There, yeah. there was a lot of that. So, but it but it was cool. You know, it it was the whole process was fun. Like just showing the fans, like you know, he's like as I was saying, like we showed Zach Oak, and and he loved it. But he was like, you know, the fans are really gonna, you know, they're gonna be pissed off, you know, because these look really good, and these should be in Marvel Legends. So that's when I was like, you know that's when I started to internalize like it, with every bit of hate that was geared towards that line, I would internalize and I was like, just feed it to me, give me even more hate. So it, like, and, and I'm going to give you everything. Like I'm going to give you the characters that you don't, that, that you don't have in Marvel Legends. I'm going to make sure that they're painted in a way that you always wanted to be in Marvel Legends. Like everything that you're pissed off about, I'm going to put into the Marvel Universe line. And, and make you, force you into like finally giving in and saying, all right, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not by every one of these guys, but this, this, the Scar Hulk is pretty cool. The Planet Hulk or whatever it is, the, you know, the, the Juggernaut or the Union Jack, if you see it, it's like, all right, this is, this is pretty cool. I, I can't, I can't front on it. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't. You, you didn't turn every fan, but I, I think you brought in a lot of new fans and and turned some six-inch collectors back to the four-inch. Um, I mean, I've always been a. I I like both scales, so I've always loved both lines. But um, but and and, and to me, like I, I I felt and I still feel that they can live together. You yeah, know, I, I still think that there is a a, a place for three and three quarter inch. It kind of hurts my heart that you know that that you know that there isn't a, a three and three quarter inch Marvel or DC. You know, it, it, when I was working on Marvel Universe, and then we had heard that Mattel was working on their, their DC three and three quarter inch line, I was like, man. At first, I got super super frightened, super scared, but then I was like, man, this is going to be so much fun because now it's like. You know, it's it's Marvel versus DC all over again. Right. You you know what I mean? And and now like fans could be able to have, you know, we could just feed each other, you know, and, and um so when, when the DC line stopped, I was kinda I was really bummed out about it. Because I I really wanted to to see where it would go. Now it's probably fair to say or would you agree that probably the the death knell of the four inch as we knew it is basically just 
mainly due to the price expense to make the figures that you know now it costs unfortunately 15 bucks to get a marvel universe quality figure yeah. and then people generally think well i'm just gonna pay 20 bucks and get a six inch figure um, yeah i mean but to me you know everything is is expensive to me you know i mean an action figure in and of itself is an expensive endeavor yeah but it really takes with in my just and this is my opinion it just takes um those who are willing to invest in the vision of it you know like and and not not just producing it but also on the retail lane like you got to be able to see the full scope of it you know and maybe like if if you know, if a property has three, you know, four or five characters in it, and three and three quarters may not, you know, sell really well. But in my mind, I think that when you have a vast amount of characters that you can play with, that that lends itself to that type of arena. And and not only that, but you can also like again, like play with scales. You can play with vehicles. You can do environments and play sets and everything where where now you can just encompass a larger landscape of 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 toys into it you know and when you start it, you you really can't do that in six years. i mean you really just get your, your six cents extra figure then that's it you know and then you may get a builder figure but that's it but in three and three quarter inch man you can get your figure you get your your, your larger figure you build a figure you build you can have, you can get the whole world you know, and I just think that it takes that mindset to be able to be willing to not only create that, produce that, but also see the potential, of the retail potential of it and get behind and stand behind it and, and uh, give it to the fans. Because, you know, kids, even though, you know, kids do have a lot of, you know, um, things in front of them now that, that take away from their, you know, attention and imagination, you know, kids are relatively the same. You know, it's just, you just, you just gotta get it to them at a, at a unique way, a particular way, you know. And and um, and with the scale of three and quarter inch, or how mobile it is, to carry around and play with it on the go. To me, it just lends itself to the true nature of how kids play with action figures. Now, I, I realize you, you you obviously you don't work at Hasbro anymore, so you know you can't speak to what they would do or wouldn't do, but. Let, let me ask the question this way. if if you were running your own toy company where you know financially every you know the buck stops with you and you were given the opportunity to have the marvel license would you push do you think you could make a, a similar line to marvel universe and have it be successful in today's toy market and would you you know at risk. I, I mean, I, I would definitely give it give it a try. I, I would I would love to do do. I mean, I would be confident to do that, you know. And and um, because to me, working on Marvel Universe and just knowing, knowing how I was behind the scenes, but also kind of looking gauging how I was like from the fan perspective, there was so much meat that's left on the bone, you know. And and um, but. And, and also now, technology has really, really changed where you can get some really good detail, really good deco, and it really just takes that, the confidence to be behind it, you know, and, and um, like, it, 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 it kind of frustrates me that I, that I don't see what I would like to see, like, I would like to see a Savage Land kind of set. You know, you can really, you can do a lot more themes where you can, you can encompass three and three quarter inch and, you know, add more legs to, to the line, you know, and by theming it particular ways, you know, and, and that's, that's, that was our approach in the beginning. And that's one reason why we kind of use S.H.I.E.L.D. as the hook because S.H.I.E.L.D., you know, Nick Fury kind of has his tentacles and everything and then you can, you, you you can bring in all of these other characters. You can bring in their vehicles and and things like that. Other story elements that you can play with, you know. And and um, in order to build out this this huge world and universe, it's it's much more of an expense to do that in a six inch scale. And and um, 
and you're also very limited of, of the offerings that you're going to get. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you can answer this, but was there ever, while you were working at Hasbro and on the Marvel Universe line, was there a, a vehicle or a place that, like, maybe a danger room place that or anything that you had really tried to push for or maybe even started working on? You, but Jay. <laughs> you are the Anderson Cooper of this. Look at you, man. It, the, I wanted to do, like, I, and I think some fans have saw it, but one of the first, the most iconic things that I wanted was, was Nick Fury's um, flying car, uh -huh. the shield car. And um, it was so cool. Like the wings had popped out and everything. And, and uh, it was it was a, a uniquely designed type of car. Um, and we did have like the Quinjet for the Avengers movie and everything, but I wanted to do, wanted to do an actual classic Quinjet. I would have loved and, that. And uh, like, and, and I, and one of the things that I wanted to do that Dwight and I, Dwight Stall and I, had was kicking around was trying to do like a build a figure, um, helicarrier. So you can buy like two pieces of it, but you can you could just buy as many pieces as you want and just keep expanding it, and expanding it, and expanding it, so you can eventually have like the, the U.S. flag, you know? Like yeah. You try to yeah, they did you know, come out with that helicarrier eventually, but it was kind of it was a little bit on the small side, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but you know there was a lot of other things that I wanted to do, like you know, it, um, that I would like to see, like exploring like the Shi'ar Empire and doing stuff with that, and and um, doing more stuff with mole men, like the Savage Land, and and um, you know. It, there's, and then now, you know, with video games and everything, I mean, you can really incorporate like the layers and different environments and, and the, the potential now is just so much more, more just, just is, is just so much more meat there. Yeah. I think now more so than ever before, but, you know, retail is very, um, you know, the retail practices can be very safe. You know what I mean, and and um, and, and 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 catering to that it can be pretty safe at times. But it's also it also depends on the brand too. And like, I don't think that everything should be printed quarter inch. But I but I I definitely see the potential in where you see like these vast amounts of characters and environments and everything where you can, you can play with that and. It could be really, really good. For you to All right. Well, let's let's move on a little bit. Obviously, um, you left Hasbro, um, and I think if I remember correctly, you went for a short time to Jazzwares, right? Yeah. Yep. Work, worked down here and um, helped out with uh, work on some uh, Hanna Barbera stuff and uh, like uh, Space Ghost, and and uh, we also had uh, like. Well, we had a different, like, it was a lot of cartoon, and Nickelodeon, a lot of Nickelodeon stuff. They had the Nickelodeon license. And, um, yeah, it, that was a unique experience. It was, it was, it wasn't the fit for me. Um, and, and, but it's cool to see now that Jazz World is still in, in the game and doing some really cool stuff. Yeah, with the Fortnite. And... Yeah, yeah. Now, when you went to Mattel, I mean, everyone, you know, you mentioned Mattel had been doing the, the four inch DC figures and, and obviously the first thing everyone thought when you went, when it was announced you were going to Mattel was you were going to be working on DC. Was that ever a consideration or were you, was it always the plan to go to Mattel to work on WWE? Yeah, that, that was always the plan. That was always the plan. I mean, it would be, it would be cool. Would have been cool. Like, from a fan perspective, and I, you know, I, I always dug Bill Benneke and all the stuff that he that he did on on that. So it was cool to actually see it from the outside, you know, see the process, you know, and 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 um, admire like you admire it from from that standpoint. You know, it was cool, cool to really see it. But the plan was always to be on on, on WWE, and it's 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 funny, like uh, like as a kid, I was a big WWF. You know, fan and everything, and I think we all were. And like, in in that time, with that time period, was just a cool thing because everything was coming up at the time. Like, comic books was really starting to gain some, some serious heat and traction, and then, uh, you know, the movies were were inspiring and everything. But like, cartoons like He Man and all that stuff was really big, and and 
at that time, WWF was, 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 was really getting hot too, you know? So, and just being from a kid watching that stuff and watching like with my grandfather and my grandmom and all that stuff. And like, like uh, I remember I was, I was, I used to, when I was a kid, I loved like Tony Atlas because he was like super Jack and everything. Yeah. My grandfather had loved, loved um, Black Jack Mulligan. And Black Jack Mulligan would like kind of do like the claw and everything, and like this big red X would come up on the screen, and he he would, like squeeze on his head, and like you know the blood would come down. Yeah, I remember. And my that. grandfather had these big, giant, meaty, ashy hands, and you know, and he was like, "Man, my nickname is Two, so he said, Two, if you ever get out of line, <laughs> put that claw on you.'" And that, and he would do that, like as the match is going on. So in my little mind, I thought it was completely real. I knew it, I mean, it was like, and I was afraid of Black Jack Mulligan. Like, I would have nightmares, like he's gonna come and get me. <laughs> What's it like? I mean, obviously, WWE is, uh, you know, real people, whereas, you know, Marvel yeah. is, you know, drawn characters and stuff. So what? how was it different? Was there an adjustment to go from working on you know, comic book based type characters to real life people um, from, from yeah that. I mean it's definitely a huge huge difference because not only is it based on people but you know those people may have an opinion too you know they may you know they have have an opinion on how they view themselves and how they want to be uh, portrayed as an action figure but I mean like as far as like uh, like WWE man is, is is unique in a sense where we literally have a movie, you know, three times a week, you know, as far as the shows go. You know, there's always new content that's going on with Raw, SmackDown, and NXT. So and every week there, there's something new that's going on. So just in and of with, with that, the brand is very, very uh, organic. But then you can also have certain situations where guys can get injured, you know, they, they may um, take some time off, or, you know, something may happen, like life instances may actually come into play and you got to adjust and scramble based on that. So that's what makes it unique, you know, it's like with superheroes, like, you know, we can have our own opinion, <laughs> and we may want to encompass the style of whatever artist or writer was going on or you know, how Namor may appeal to me or how I may envision Namor may, may not be the same way that you see him, but, you know, with, with Finn Balor, Finn Balor is like, Finn is Finn, you know right. what I mean? And, and then you got to get him right. So, um, and, and, and that is funny because, like, WWE is, is – as far as the, the plethora of, of superstars is in it is it, in that sense is very much like Marvel where it's like man you have all these unique individuals these unique personas to capture and that's what makes it really fun so you're not doing like just one type of guy you know you're doing you know it's it's, it's the most the WWE line the action figure line is is the most ethnically culturally diverse action figure line that's out there period I mean if, if you're African-American, there's something in it for you. If you're Hispanic-American, if you're Asian-American, I mean, we have all, all those bases covered. And to be able to capture that and to bring that forth is, is, is unique in and of itself, you know? So it's very challenging and, and making sure that it's a broad school that everyone is represented. That's what makes it more fun too. And, and uh, but, you know, they also have a voice, you know, they have, you know, and, and uh, you, you want to capture that because, you know, they're, they're, they're profession, they're professionals and, and very elite in what they do. But the cool part is just like, just like any kid or just like you and I, man, when they see an action figure, their eyes light up, you know, so when you have, when you have to make an action figure based off of someone else, you really want them to say, man, like, this is me. You know, you, you want them to give it to their kids, give it to their parents, you know. You want them to have a, a, a sense of pride about that, you know. So, and, and also, we, we, you know, we may do action figures based on superstars that aren't around anymore. So, right. you know, you want to be able to really embrace what they, you know, are about and, and capture that and convey that, you know. So, 
um, the team like you know does an amazing job, man, and, and, and um, it's 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 a, it's a unique honor to to work with that, and it's fun too. Like it's something that like again, like I've always enjoyed as a kid. I enjoy wrestling and everything, so to be able to be on this side of the fence, you know, and and to and to you know, the, these superstars are I, iconic, you know, and then to add on to that level, you know, is this is fun. Now, do you get to interact a lot with the actual wrestlers themselves when you're designing the figures, or is it pretty much just based on footage and, and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, uh, they, they, like, when we get them scanned, like, we do 3D scans uh, of their heads and everything. So, like, they're right there. They're giving their expressions and everything. They want their persona to convey. Um, but we do, we, we work a lot with, with WWE to uh, show how the process is and how, and how the artwork or you know, the sculpt is going to be. And then WWE will will um, give it, you know, show it to its superstars and then they'll have their input and everything like that. So it's, it's, it's it, it, a lot of people are involved, you know, in which, which also, there's a lot of eyes on it, you know, so it, that's, that's another reason why you want to get it right. It, it's, it's I was like, going to ask, like, I mean, you're kind of a big guy yourself, but some of these wrestlers are pretty huge. Have you ever been like nervous? Like, oh my God, they're not going to like it. What is it? What are they gonna no, do? No, no, you know they they've all been been really really cool. You know, like I, I um I, I would love to do some pull ups <laughs> with them and stuff like that. But but they are they are really cool. You know, it's like when when we do interact with them, it's in the capacity of like you know like with me, like I always you know make sure that they're already right comfortable and everything. But to um you know just when we're scanning them, make sure that you know like they're they're comfortable and and all the different uh, facial expressions come through and all that stuff but um you know they're you know they're they're fans too like some, some of them are toy fans comic book fans you know movie fans and everything so um at times man just as much as you know as i am in all of them they are in awe of us because, like, wow, you know, they're about to have an action figure made of them, you know. So it, it's a mutual respect. It's a mutual respect, which is very, very cool. Now, do you work on? I mean, there's a lot of different sublines in the WWE, you know, universe of figures that Mattel does. Do you work on all those different sublines, or do you work? No, on I'm working on. I'm working on a new a new secret line that's going to be coming soon. I can't talk about it, but it's going to be pretty fun. Okay. Um, but uh, you know, we have Bill McKenna, you know, he works on the action figures and then uh John Lee he works on the basic action figures and, and uh and but we all we, we all chime in and give each other's opinions and, and insights and everything to make sure like it's very collaborative so we all you know add on to it to make sure that the product is is, is on point. It's very, very collaborative. You know, we have our copywriter involved, marketing, like, and and that's the thing that I that I dig too, man, because it's a lot of like I'm used to working in a gorilla kind of style and fashion, you know. So, and and getting all the different individuals and and you know all the players involved to express themselves to make the best product come forward. So our team, the WWE team, is very much like that. You know, it's very much like how I was at you know, at Hasbro, and, and I try to, you know, we, we, it, it reminds me of toy business since we're all, like, we're, we're, we're in this huge, huge environment, but we're also in our own bubble, you know what I mean? And, and it's very, very unique, even in Mattel sense, you know, it, the WWE brand is unique. So, um, you know, and, and we, it, it, I mean, just like in the comic book sense, on the Marvel end, where we were all, like, um, you know, super knowledgeable of, of marvel and everything is the same way with with wwe you know and and it's like some super knowledgeable guys who know the exact time and day and date of an event you know who wore what what happened and it's, it's very fun and cool to have those conversations so it's the same passion it's the same passion um to to not only just make really cool product uh and successful product but but to um, you know, also stick to your guns and and um, and keep pushing it forward, you know. So 
and having that kind of champion mentality to keep pushing forward. So that's very much there uh, in WWE. Um, did you do any work on the new uh, Masters of the Universe WWE line? Did you have any hand in that, or I had um, did some early concept stuff with that, and then um, then those concepts wound up changing and you know becoming changing and changing, becoming what you saw and everything, and and um, you know the. the like to for me, that was like one of the first things, like you know, that I always wanted to to do was a WWE um, Master Universe matchup because it was it was just such a no brainer because they all they you know it came up together. So it's so cool to actually see that you know Bill Benicky drove that home and it was actually able to to make that happen, you know. And and uh, but we we were all sat around, we all gave insights and everything like that about who we like to see and what we like to, to see them do like in actual figure form and everything. So it, it was, it was cool just to be, to, to, to be a part of it and, and watch that whole evolutionary process. Now, now the secret line that you're working on, will we maybe see something about this at toy fair next month or is it still a ways away? I think so. You know, I, I, I think, I think so. I think it's true. I think it'll make it a point to toy fair. Nice. Well, um, I guess my last question, actually I have two questions. So my um, second to last question for you is going to be out of all the different companies and lines that you've worked on over the years, what was your favorite figure, would you say, or is there a figure that really stands out to you? Um, Man, it, it's, it's not one. It's, it's like so many, for so many different reasons, you know, um, like uh like scorpion because that was like one of the first ones you know but then like hasbro it was so many different you know um internal things that happened you know like i remember when um we were tasked with with doing um some exclusives and you know we kind of i was brainstorming trying to figure out what to do and then kind of i found out that some old um, toy biz tools were destroyed, you know, so we couldn't use those bodies. And that, that was like, you know, the whole swapping of parts is essential to Marvel, Marvel Universe and Marvel Legends and everything, like the reuse of those parts. Right. And I was just like so ticked off, man, that that had happened. And um, like one of the things that like, Dwight Stahl and I, we would do, we would sit in each other's office, I was sitting in his office, and we would look at the action figure, like, kind of stare at it, and be like, oh, you know who I see? I see this character, I see that guy, like, take, let's take that kilt, and take that, that gauntlet, and repaint it that way, now we got so-and-so. So, you know, I'm sitting in his office, kind of took off, and he had these 12-inch figures, and they look the 12-inch store and all that, and, um, like, the, the 12-inch legends, mm -hmm. and I'm like, those would be so dope if it was like, you know, something for three and three quarter inch, man. And, and then that's when, that's how it involved to the giant scrawl and the frost giant. And like, it was, it was like, it was, that came out of just like a necessity. You know, we had to, you know, had to come up with something that just so happened that, you know, that was sitting there right in front of us. So I love, I love those for that reason that that happened. And then, like, the Galactus figure, like, that Galactus figure was done entirely, like, in China, you know, and, and uh, you will always hear stuff like, you know, how you know, certain sculpts wouldn't come out the right way and all this other stuff, and I just wanted to prove that whole theory wrong, and our, our team over in, in China was, with, they were major Marvel fans, so, like, the universe had just aligned in, in this amazing way where we just had all these these people who really enjoyed and understand understood the brand working on it. So like the Galactus was just so fun and you know <laughs> working with Jesse um in the sound booth to um speak the words of Galactus, you know, and like <laughs> and we were going back and forth about him saying to me my uh to me to me my herald or, or it, it, he just wasn't doing it the way that I envisioned it. So we just kept doing that part over and over and over again. So then eventually he was like, look, I'm just going to do it. Don't chime in. So he wound up doing the voice for Galactus. And I didn't know. I didn't know that was Jesse Falcon doing And for the Sentinel too. 
in, I, I in love the, that Sentinel, the Marvel Universe Sentinel. I love that's yeah. one of my favorite figures. Yes, and and like like it's like stuff like that. I, I mean, I I love like. I mean, clearly, like I'm I'm super honored to be you know um, just in this position where I can somewhat be aligned to the Marvel stuff, and and that's what I love. With, like that's what I love. With, like I I just love everything. The whole process of working on that on that line and. and um, it, it was just so oh, yeah, fun. Yeah, right. Now, for my last question, I, I like to ask this with uh, a lot of people working in the industry. Have you ever, I mean, obviously the toy industry is pretty much dominated by these major licenses and everything, but have you ever considered, especially with things like Kickstarter and stuff, have you ever considered or maybe one day see yourself, you know, creating your own action figure line and trying to launch it? Is that something like maybe behind the scenes? Obviously, you wouldn't want to probably reveal even if you are but is that have oh, you yeah. dabbled in creating your own action figure line and and do you think yeah, all the time I, I think i think we all i think we all kind of do you know at, at some point but i definitely you know would love to be able to do that but see with me, with me i like i uh, i love the, the the collaborative part of of it you know with like having like the crew around to be able to not only bounce ideas off, but like having those people are, are, are experts and their expertise like me, you know, and and that's one of the things that about this the toy industry, like this is all about relationships, you know, and and um and and you can have the vision, but then other people, other guys really have to carry out that vision, you know, and you gotta be able to trust them to do that, you know, and you know, I've just been so fortunate to work alongside, you know, some guys who really carry out the vision, you know, and, and, and uh, so that's, that's what I love, like, you know, being able to work with um, sculptors that I've always admired, you know, that I grew to love and everything. And, you know, I remember back in the day, you know, Eddie Wires was around. He was an extremely talented painter who's no longer with us, but it was like having that type of talent to work with. And, and everyone infused themselves into it, which made it what it is, and, and which is one of the things that I always loved about about Marvel Comics. You know, even though you know it, there, there was a standard how it should be done, but everyone put their unique essence into it that made it what it is. You know, so yeah, you know, I would love to be able to do that and kind of you know have that that type of um, environment where we can, you know really have like a crew of some super talented guys and to do some stuff so um and, and it's 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 been mentioned before some some stuff has come across like my desk and everything and, and um and it's also about timing too you know what i mean like the, the right time to do stuff and i think right. that now you know it's it's um we're starting to see we're starting to see a shift you know it's, it's like I, I think that properties are starting to become uh, not I mean everything is licensed now but it seems like you know the writing writing of certain properties is starting to get so much better and I think that like like you're starting to see like The Witcher on Netflix and stuff like that where the, the writing of some of these properties and, and video games and films and everything is starting to get so much better and in turn starting to create a space where you can do product based off but you know but at the same time and you know the, you know, we live in a, a very fair weather kind of era now where it's like, you know, this is there and this is there and this is so much, you know, but um, I would like to be able to, you know, in order for that to happen, like work on something that's very, very expansive, like a, a, a very expansive universe where there's a lot to pull from that you can really um, show the longevity. I, I imagine. Well, I, I want to um, thank you again for taking so much time and talking with me today. I, I know the fans. Yeah, will thank you, man. I, I love what you're doing, man. And, and like, you know, it, this was like such an honor, like coming, you know, I mean, you have Jerry McLuso, who's one of my, he's not only a friend, but he's, you know, someone I consider a mentor. So that, that was a really dope interview. And then, you know, Todd and Fallen, I mean, he's like, you know, the godfather of all this stuff. stuff. So, um Yo, I mean, this is really fun. So thank you so much for having me, man. And, and uh, you're the man. You're the man. Uh, I, I, the Anderson be here with... Cooper of toys, man. <laughs> the toy news. Hey, spread the word, man. Tell, tell everybody. 
<laughs> All right, man. Well, again, thank you for taking the time and talking with us. And we look forward to uh, hearing more about your secret WWE project, hopefully uh, next month at Toy Fair. Okay, so that's it for today. I hope you did enjoy the interview. Again, I do apologize for losing about the first 15 minutes of the interview. Uh, I was really bummed about that, but but hopefully you still, it was a lot of good, interesting tidbits of information, especially if you're into the Marvel Universe stuff. You know, I thought that was really uh, very interesting to hear Dave talk about that and getting that line started and everything. Now, if you like this type of content, if you like to see me do more interviews, this is my third one. The first one I did was with Todd McFarlane, and the second one with, was with Jerry Macaluso. I will put links to both of those if you have not yet checked those out. But if you like this kind of content, let me know in the comments section below. And then also, please feel free to pass, you know, the, this video around your social media feeds, you know, get the word out. The better these videos, these types of videos do, the, the more views that they get, um, the easier it will be for me to continue doing them, getting guests lined up, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, again, you know, if you want to see me do more of this content, let me know in the comments section. But also, uh, feel free to help me uh, spread the word about it so that more people are aware of it and, and can tune in and watch it. As always, subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and until next time, guys... I'll catch you later. Hey, thanks for watching today's video and be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and hit that bell notification to alert it every time I upload a new video. And be sure to head over to the Toy News International and Marvelous News Message Sports Communities. It's a great place to talk toys and win cool contests like $100 store credits to Big Bad Toy Store. And remember, action figures are great. <laughs>